This video is continuing right where the previous video left off. We're in part 110, chapter 12, then 11. Uh, that refers to MATLAB for Engineers 5th edition, where the contents of this document covered some material from chapter 12. That was the previous video where we were doing some symbolic plotting. And now we're going to move on or move backwards to some content from chapter 11, starting with numeric data types. But the chapter itself just generally concerns data types. I'm going to start with a little PowerPoint that I have here. All right, so here's a diagram of some of the data types in MATLAB, and it's a hierarchical diagram. So at the top, we have more general types, and the only one that really has subtypes here is the numeric. But then as we get lower, we get into the more specific types. Now, I want to bring your focus to the very bottom right box right down here, because this is the default numeric type in MATLAB. Most of the data we've been working with in MATLAB has been composed of real double precision floating point numbers. However, we have also looked at integers, logical types, one or zero to represent true or false, character data, so text, and then also we've looked at symbolics. So data types are very important in various programming languages because although everything in a computer is ultimately represented by ones and zeros, we need to know, the computer needs to know, MATLAB needs to know, what is the appropriate translation to use on that data? If I've got a bunch of ones and zeros, am I supposed to translate that to an integer? Am I supposed to translate that to a double, which represents a value with decimal places? Am I supposed to translate it to text? Uh, MATLAB needs to know the answer to this question in order to interpret it correctly. What can go wrong if we try and interpret some data with the wrong interpretation? So here I've got a PowerPoint file. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to open it with Notepad++. Right away, we see that this is not probably what we want. Certainly, there is some text that we can read in plain English. And if we scroll down somewhere in here, there will be some other text that we can read in plain English. But for the most part, this is not the appropriate interpretation to use on a PowerPoint file. So to extend that diagram we were just looking at a little bit, these two blocks have been added up here. And also some of the names have been changed, right? So now it's character arrays, logical arrays, numeric arrays. And all this diagram is really showing you is that the vectors, matrices, and arrays that we've looked at so far have one important limitation, and that is that they can only hold one information type, one type of data. You can't make a vector that has some characters in it and some numbers in it. That just doesn't work out. We will look at, in an upcoming video shortly, cell arrays and structure arrays in which you can mix different data types. And I've touched on these very briefly throughout the course, but we'll actually dig into them in a little bit more detail, and I'll describe them and what they do. But for this video, we're going to focus on numeric data types. MATLAB conforms to particular standards when representing its default type, this double type. And this is the most common standard, so MATLAB is going to behave pretty much like your C's and your Java's and your Python's and most of your common programming languages, unless something is different for some reason. As a side note, you might wonder about the word double. Where does that come from? Let me be clear, nothing is being multiplied by two here. We're not doubling something, it's just a name. It's a noun. And it comes from an unfortunate historical coincidence, or not coincidence, but the fact that there was a data type, it was 32 bits, and at some point memory got cheap enough where people were like, you know what would be nice? It would be nice to have 64 bits. Sure, but what should we call such a thing? Well, we've got this 32-bit type and we're going to make it twice as large. Let's call it a double. And that's why it has that name. So something was doubled. The amount of memory that's used is doubled, but you're not like multiplying a number by two when you convert to a double type. We will also look at integers. So integers are used to only represent positive or negative whole numbers. You can't have decimal places with integers. And we'll see that we can use integers of various sizes. And when I say sizes, I mean the amount of memory that they use. So some of them will occupy a large amount of memory and some of them will occupy a smaller amount of memory. You might want to use smaller integers with, for example, images, where every single pixel in a color image is going to need to be represented by at least three numbers, one for the red component, one for the green component, and one for the blue component. And with all the many, many pixels in an image, it's probably a good idea to use relatively small integers for that. So that's what we will do. And we'll actually see that on one of the very last videos of this sequence. Complex numbers, as I will state, 
are represented by default by two doubles, because there's a real part and an imaginary part. But you could also store them as singles or integers, which we will show once I get to the code here. And then there's some practice problems from the book, MATLAB for Engineers 5th Edition. I'm just going to get into the code at this point, however. But first, I will note that this PowerPoint slide, as well as, of course, the uh, MATLAB document, are both available, link to them in the video description. Also worth noting at this point is that all the code that I'm going to show you in this video is going to work perfectly in Octave with perhaps some very, very small exceptions that we've already seen before. Like I think the table function gets used somewhere in here. But other than that, it's going to work exactly as written in Octave as it does here in MATLAB. And I'll note when we get to something that doesn't work. All right, now the first thing that we need to do is we need to set up our workspace so that we can see some information that maybe we wouldn't have paid attention to before. Now, unfortunately, I don't know how to make the font size of the workspace larger, so I'm just going to zoom in on it on the video and hope that's sufficient. But first, we want to click on this circle with a triangle in it, and we want to go to Choose Columns, and we want to select Bytes, and then go back to that, and then also select uh, Class right here. And then, when I run this first section, a variety of variables are going to be created. OK, so I've created variables A, B, C, D, and E. A is literally just the number 1. B is a vector of numbers 1 through 10. C is a matrix, two rows, three columns. D is the same matrix, except it's inside this function that says single. And then likewise, E is the number 5, but it's in this function called single. Now, if you bring your attention to the workspace right here, we'll see those five variables. We'll see their values, as many as can fit on the screen at least. And then we'll see how many bytes they occupy. This is bytes with a Y. A byte is simply a grouping of eight bits. A bit is a one or a zero, so this is eight of those grouped together. So eight bytes is eight times eight, 64 bits. And as I mentioned, a double is represented in computer memory by 64 bits. What do we call the thing that's half as large as a double? Well, MATLAB calls it a single, which is pretty reasonable. Other programming languages will typically call it a floating point number or a float. And I believe that simply refers to the decimal place and the way in which if you multiply by 10 or divide by 10, that decimal place will float to the left or to the right in the number. So you've got your digits, and you can just float that decimal place to the left or right by multiplying by 10, which is important when I start talking about the representation of doubles and singles, which I will do in this video. In this section, all I'm really showing is that the default type is double. A single double occupies 8 bytes, so 10 of them occupy 80. 6 of them, in a matrix or not in a matrix, occupy 48. And then if we use this single function, well, they're going to occupy half as much space in memory. And if we're only using small values like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then there's no reason not to use single. Although I would argue that just for simplicity, you just let MATLAB use the default type because you don't really want to get in the habit of switching your types back and forth and being concerned about this all the time. Although it is something that you need to be aware of if you are potentially using very, very large or very, very small values. Continuing on down, we can ask MATLAB what is the largest and smallest non-zero single or double that can be represented using real max and real min. I did switch the format to long here very briefly before switching it back to short, but it doesn't actually make a difference because it's going to be in scientific notation. And these are the results that I get. So the very largest single type value that can be represented in MATLAB is about 3.4 times 10 to the 38 power. And the smallest non-zero single type value is about 1.2 times 10 to the negative 38th power. Compared to the biggest and smallest doubles, and it's not even close, we're looking at about 1.8 times 10 to the 308th power, and about 2.2 times 10 to the negative 308th power. It's just not even close. An important thing to be aware of here, though, is that not all of the real numbers in between these can be represented. For example, this number right here, which I don't even know how to express it. Like, I don't think there's a word for, you know, a 1 and then 308 zeros. But suppose I subtract 1 from this. Just 1, like a single number. Not like replacing this 2 with a 1, which would be subtracting off, who knows, you know, some number that's got a 1 and then... 299 or so or something like that zeros 
That's a massive number. I mean, just like one. You can't represent that number. And most programming languages have this limitation. And you can't represent that number because you would need to represent all those digits. You would need to represent all of this, except change this to a one, and follow it up with some close to 300 nines, and that would be your number. The way doubles and singles are represented in MATLAB and most other programming languages is that those 64 bits, some of them are dedicated to representing the digits. And others of the bits are dedicated to representing the exponent on the 10. They're sort of stored in a scientific notation. Typically, also, one bit is dedicated to whether the number is positive or negative. And then your computer puts together the result by reading off the part that represents the digits and then multiplying that by 10 raised to the power of the part of memory representing the exponent. But that means there's going to be potentially enormous gaps between the numbers that can be represented. This can be represented. What's the next smallest number that can be represented? Well, it is changing this 2 to a 1, assuming that all the decimal places are being displayed here, which I believe they are. But that number is enormous, right? Like we said, I mean, this is times 10 to the 308th power. So, you know, it's even, it's a bigger, it's not a trillion, it's some gajillion, you know, number that we're subtracting off there. But if you think about it for a second, the real numbers are necessarily always going to have gaps in their representation. Because how many numbers are there, real numbers, between 0.1 and 0.2? There's an infinite number. Because you can just keep extending the decimal places back and back and back and back. So the real numbers always are going to have gaps in their representation because computers are finite. Because we can only pack so much data into physical memory. And that's what we're seeing here. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, I have a whole video, it's like 30 minutes long, dedicated to the topic of how do computers represent decimal values. And I have much better diagrams. I mean, I'm not even using diagrams here. I will post a link to that video in this video's description. Continuing on down, I'm going to show you an example of when this might actually matter. And it's when you're dealing with very large or very small values. Let me run this code and then I'll talk through it after we talk through the graph. All right, so here's this graph right here. And there are two lines. The blue represents a calculation made using doubles. And the red represents a calculation made using singles. And they're different. The same calculation was done on both. All right, now let's scroll through the code here, but I'm gonna keep the graph up. So the first thing I do is I create a vector of the numbers one through 10 million right there. And then I create another vector that's one over each of those values. So the first number in this vector is one over one, and the last number is one over 10 million. And by default, the precision is double precision. Now then I use the built-in cumulative summation function in MATLAB, very unfortunately named in my opinion. Uh, they are really aggressive about abbreviations, and I think they could have done better on that one, but it's short for cumulative sum. And what that means is, in this new vector part sum that's created from the harmonic vector right here, the first number is going to be 1. And the second number in the vector is going to be 1 plus 1 over 2. And the third number is going to be 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3. And so on. So it's just a cumulative sum. You know, the thousandth value in this vector is simply going to be the sum of the first thousand values in the harmonic vector. Now, for efficiency, we're only going to worry about every 1,000th value. We're not going to worry about all 10 million of them. So here I create a vector starting at 1,000, going up by 1,000, and continuing all the way to 10 million. I index into my part sum vector right here at those m positions to get a smaller vector, part sum cell, which is like part sum select values. That's what it's supposed to be short for. And then I plot it, and that's the blue line. Continuing on down. And then I do the exact same calculation with one tiny little difference. Instead of using doubles, I use singles right here. And then I graph it as a red dotted line. And we see that it's different. So what's going on here? A few things. So the first thing is the red line flattens out. And that's happening because we're adding in subsequent values that are so small that the representation and the amount of memory we have can't really distinguish between them and zero. So they'll just round it to zero. So while the doubles still have enough precision to represent those numbers, or at least get close to them, the singles have run out of memory and can no longer represent those values, can no longer distinguish between those values and zero, and just says, screw it, round to zero. Now another weird thing you might have noticed 
is this hump right here. I'm zooming in on my graph, which you can do by scrolling your mouse wheel. So the red actually goes up before it flattens out. What's happening there? Now, this is just my theory, but I'm pretty sure it's what's happening. I believe when MATLAB tries to represent whatever numbers are being added in to the cumulative summation around this part, since the red, the singles, can't represent the values that are trying to be added in, but can represent values close by, they're using those numbers that are close by, but they're rounding up. So we're actually adding in values that are too large and losing accuracy in that manner right here. And so that's why it's briefly too large before it's like, nope, now we're at zero and we can't get any closer. And I do think it's worth noting that from a like mathematically perfect sense, the blue line is not necessarily accurate either. Some of these fractions cannot be represented perfectly, even with doubles. And so there is some rounding going on. And that's kind of the whole point of this section, is that when you are working with computers and you are measuring something precisely, there can be rounding errors. And you need to think about whether that is impacting whatever calculation you're making in a significant way. And so understanding how the values are represented in memory is somewhat important. This video is getting a little long, so I'm going to stop it right here. In the very next video, I'll continue right where I left off, and we're going to look at the integer data type and explore some of its aspects in the same way that we've explored singles and doubles in this video.